Hey, how y'all doing out there? I am Frank Red, and once again, you are locked tight in the dungeon with me uh, to discuss what's happening in the world of sports, and um, maybe we'll mention uh, some other things that's on my mind with regards to entertainment. So a great movie. We'll see if we have time. Um, this is going to be a fast-paced show, and I wanted to come on specifically because the Golden State Warriors had their biggest victory of the year a 134 to 120 uh, humiliating win over the Los Angeles Lakers. And, um, you know, herps, uh, hopes reign eternal. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, for Warrior fans out there, because nobody in the NBA right now is playing better than the Golden State Warriors. And um, season's not over. They got three games to go. And, um, you know, they got to get things done. They got to finish the season strong. But uh, I don't think things could set up any better uh, for for the Golden State Warriors uh, than they are right now. And we're going to get an opportunity to talk about that. If you're listening for the first time, my name is Frank Red. As I said, this is the In the Dungeon Show. Uh, we pop on air every now and then. We don't have a set schedule. But, you know, when things are happening in the world of sports, there's a good chance that uh, we will be on top of it. Um, along with the Golden State Warriors tonight, um, you know, we're going to wrap up the uh, college basketball season for uh, the men and the women. Um, like last year's WNBA season for the women, that was a breakthrough year. This was a breakthrough year uh, for women in college basketball, uh, witnessed by the 18 plus million people who watched the championship game between in South Carolina and Iowa, a game that um, the Gamecocks were victorious at. Dawn Staley winning her third national championship. And um, the great Caitlin Clark uh, um, finishes her college career as literally the most decorated woman's college player of all time. Uh, that deserves um, the attention that it has received. Uh, she's going to move on to the WNBA. And um, I have no doubt that she'll be a dominant player. To what extent, we can discuss that. And maybe we will have time to do that a little later. But front and center, again, it's the Golden State Warriors. Um, incredible win tonight. I was on with uh, Larry Kruger uh, a couple of nights ago. And people were talking about, but why don't the Warriors play well in Los Angeles? Is it because of the lighting? Um, other variables that, that maybe fans and talk show hosts are, are not aware of. I said that I think the Lakers just get amped up to step, to stop Stephen Curry. And they generally do a pretty good job of bottling him up and hedging and doing all the things that they need to do, uh, to cut the head off the snake. Well, tonight there was none of that. And if the Warriors were a snake, they had like 19 heads. And uh, I don't care if Anthony Davis didn't play. Uh, he certainly um, uh, makes the Lakers more formidable. But the, the Warriors made 26 threes tonight. 26 threes. Stephen Curry was six for six. GP threw. GP two knocked in a couple. Draymond Green was five for five in the first half. Clay Thompson looked like vintage Clay. GP2's defense was unbelievable. Wiggins looked like a lightweight All Star. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna get too loud, but have, has anybody seen Andrew Wiggins play better than he's playing right now since a couple of years ago? And I actually think. One of the biggest um, unpublicized moves of the night was in the third quarter when Kaminga was having kind of a tough run. He was off balance. He really wasn't playing all that well. The Warriors called timeout, and I think everybody watching and in the building thought that he was going to sub Kaminga out. He didn't do that. He kept them in there. And... He played really, really hard, and all of a sudden, the light switch came on for the Warriors. So, again, I want to give Curry credit for going against his tendencies 
Because of the normal circumstance, he would have taken Kaminga out. He did not do that. And Kaminga responded with spirit at play. And um, that was good to see. All right. Hit me up at Big Frank Red on X if you uh, don't currently follow me. Uh, we have a comment section. You want to comment on the game or some other games um, or anything else in the world of sports, uh, use the comment section. Let's, let's get the show started. I want to go out and welcome the great Vicky. Vicky says, hi, Frank. What a game. I know they can beat Portland. The Pelicans are going to be tough. And they will beat Utah. Can you also talk about Tara Vanderveer's retirement from Stanford? Yeah. That's on my call sheet of uh, topics to talk about. Uh, just to um, introduce the topic, the great Tyra Vanderveer has been the coach at Stanford for over 30 years. She's been coaching for 40 plus years, 45, I believe. She finishes her illustrious career with three national titles and 1,200 victories. And um, she must be a pretty good dancer because I think the timing is perfect. Um, it, it was time for her to give the reign to somebody else. Um, Kate Pay, her long-term assistant, apparently is negotiating to take over as the head coach of Stanford. Um, and the timing is perfect. First of all, Cal and Stanford going to the ACC, to me, is a joke. The last thing I want is a coach who's been coached for 40 years, who's 70 years old, traveling back and forth from the West Coast to the East Coast to coach. I didn't want to see that. I don't want to see it for the players. So I certainly didn't want to see Tyra Vanderbilt doing it. So uh, here's an opportunity for us to kind of give her her flowers. She's unbelievable. Uh, but the game with the NIL, I think she's probably in that Nick Saban, Coach K, Roy Williams club. The game is different now. And I think Stanford was going through a transition. So again, I think the timing is perfect for her to walk away. Mark Graves says, the Warriors are coming together at the right time. You called it way back, Frank. Yeah, man. I'm no genius, but I know basketball and I know sports. And the Warriors did something this year that they did not do last year. They were able to win games while developing players. And despite of, you know, Draymond's exodus and, and all the other stuff, uh, I mean, Chris Paul was gone for a while with injuries. This team seems to have pretty good chemistry. And when you have good chemistry and you're playing your best ball at the right time of year, Anything can happen. Similar to the Dallas Mavericks. When the Dallas Mavericks made those trades uh, and Kyrie and Luka finally got a chance to play together, people realized that they were excellent together and they actually like each other, they like playing off each other. So um, I'm excited. I'm, I'm really excited. Because the Warriors, if they can get into the playoffs, not the play-in, and they're not there yet, but I would love to see them get the seventh seed. Now, we're a long way from that, but, but let's dream for a second. If the Warriors match up against OKC or even Minnesota, although Cat Towns is doing five-on-five -five stuff now, I think they got a chance. Uh, I don't want them playing Denver in the first round. And I ideally don't want them playing the Lakers in the play-in. I don't. Uh, the, the Warriors were fantastic tonight. Uh, they'll strap it up against anybody. But um, the Lakers are still a pretty tough matchup for the Warriors. I mean, if you disagree, I would love to hear your uh, thoughts on that. But, I mean, LeBron was kind of going through the team like, Swiss cheese and Anthony Davis wasn't out there. So, um, give me New Orleans, give me Sack, you know, or maybe give me Phoenix. I mean, who knows? Um, but I, I think the Warriors can beat any of those teams. But from a matchup perspective, 
perspective, I don't think the, the Lakers are the best matchup for the Warriors. But when you make 26 threes, I don't care who you play. You're going to have a really good chance to win. And defensively, um, I mean, with the exception of LeBron, I, I thought that their rotations were pretty good. Uh, GP2 is like that that secret weapon that Kerr can, fertile, can, 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 can thoroughly utilize right now. Uh, uh, GP has been hurt over the past couple of years. We haven't seen him more healthy uh, we haven't seen him healthier than he is right now. And what that has done is given him the opportunity to do some amazing things defensively. Uh, he's finishing at a high rate around the basket. And oh, by the way, his shooting has come back. So you talk about a weapon. GP2 is playing great basketball. And he has to be one of the most um, diverse and all-around players in the NBA, specifically on the defensive end. But even like in like five to seven-minute intervals, you're not going to find too many guys in the NBA, period, who can do the things that he can do. So, I definitely want to big him up. Um, Mark said that I was right a long time ago about the Warriors. Um, sometimes I don't even remember what I say. But the one thing that I have been steadfast on is Clay Thompson. I will I will pat myself on the back for that. When people were dogging Clay Thompson, talking about Clay being finished, he's no longer a starter. I'm talking about national people and local. I was like, nah, Clay's okay. Clay's fine. Leave Clay alone. What Clay needs to do is take better shots. What Clay needs to do is probably play less minutes. But Clay Thompson is in, his, is in his bag right now. And as a result, the, the Warriors offensively on certain nights are scary. I mean, Clay Thompson, I mean, let's be honest, he's playing better than Stephen Curry right now. And I, I think that's probably a function of Stephen just being tired. Uh, another brilliant move by Kerr was resting uh, Stefan on Sunday because you look at Stefan tonight, he was spry. He was ready to go. When's the last time Stefan made six three-pointers in a row? He was six for six tonight. Vicky says, I'm glad the Warriors got GP2 back last year. Yeah, I mean... At the end of the day, Vicky, um, it's been a plus for the Warriors to have him um, in their rotation and as a vital cog that they can go to. I think they bumbled it, though. I, I mean, they could have re-signed him. You know? Gundosha says, yep, you are 100% right about Clay. A lot of people were ready to move on. Yeah. Why was I right, though? Because I really don't know. I mean, I just believe in Clay. I mean, like, that dude's mental focus. And when you consider he had two serious leg injuries. Most guys don't come back from that. But his mental preparation and, I mean, his unbelievable shooting form and his discipline and his toughness just said to me this guy can still play now the Warriors got a challenge on their hands because I mean the conversation is getting louder there's going to be some upstart little team that's going to be a little crazy and throw out you know more money than the Warriors want to pay Clay and Clay kind of intimated intimated that when talking to Draymond on this most recent podcast. He says he wants to re-sign with the Warriors. I believe him. But I don't think he's taking less than $30 million. I don't. So, remember earlier this year, we had people saying that we can get Clay for $10 million? <laughs> Really? Come on. That's nuts. 25 to $30 million. Vicky says, Clay, Dre, 
and TJD are magical together. Yeah, they are. They are. He's a weapon. Vicky, think about this for a second. In the playoffs last year, the Warriors didn't have Chris Paul. They didn't have Pudzinski. They really didn't have Kaminga because he was nailed to the bench. They didn't have Trey Jackson Davis. This is a good team, a really good team. And I don't think we're really, I, I don't think we're ready to have a three hour conversation about how the, you know, the veteran young guys model is working to its full extent. I don't think we're ready to do that. But I've been thinking about it over the past couple of weeks and saying to myself, okay, there's probably two, two to three more years left with Draymond, Clay, and Stefan. I think they got three years left in them. If they can continually develop these young guys to the extent that, you know, they can bring the minutes down significantly for the veterans and have the young guys develop into some semblance of stars, um, it could be a smoother transition than I think most of us might have thought that it would be because they got some young talent. And uh, the good thing about this year's NBA draft is that the talent is really on the back end, not in the front end. So it wouldn't surprise me if the Warriors and some other smart organizations were able to snatch a player that um, – they can use next year who might even become a starter. You don't know. Good Dosha says, the real question is, will the Warriors be able to sign him? He's playing himself into a really nice contract. Yeah, he is, Good Dosha, but um, I think he wants to stay. I do believe that. Now, um, the only other team that any of us could ever envision Clay playing for are the Lakers. You know, that's it. And uh, it's going to be interesting this offseason because the general manager down there, LeBron, is going to factor in how that team looks. And he's going to make some changes. Now, I'm being somewhat facetious. Rob, Rob Palenka's done a hell of a job um, gathering players. Um but there are going to be some changes. Uh, Darvin Ham seems like a great guy, hardworking. If the Lakers don't get out of the play-in, I mean, if they lose like that 9-10 game, I don't care who they lose to. I can't see him coming back. I just can't. Uh, is, is it wrong? Yes, it's wrong. But is it uh, likely that, that he won't come back? I think so. I do. Um, it's tough business. It, nothing's fair about professional sports. But certain franchises demand certain things. And the Lakers have to be good. Well, they have to have the illusion that, that they're going to be good. Um, again, and again, like I've talked about, I'm not going to do it tonight, but I've talked about how LeBron and the Warriors might factor in a little bit. You never know. You never know. Uh, Joe Lacob is about winning. He's about box office. Um, the Warriors got a good thing going on right now. You know, so I am excited, man. I am truly excited uh, based on what I saw tonight. I still can't really figure out Wiggins. Can anybody explain this to me? I mean, literally, like in January, and in December, I mean, Wiggins was dragging. And tonight, again, he looked like a lightweight all-star. He really did. So, I mean, when you have a lineup out there of any combination of Draymond, Wiggins, Kaminga, Jackson Davis, Stephen Curry, Clay, Chris Paul, Podzinski, um... They're tough. And I got to give Pazinski some credit, too. He's not only like, I mean, there's no hesitation on his jump shots anymore. He's not taking contested shots, but because the Warriors put so many offensive players on the court, the ball finds him, and he's wide open, and he's knocking shots down. 
that bodes well for his progress. I think he needs to work on his form and, and get better. But even with that said, the guy's probably shooting 37, 38% from three right now. Uh, his floor game has been phenomenal this year. So he's played like a top 10 rookie. He was drafted 19. He's playing like a, what? I say top 10, maybe top eight. Guy's balling. Give him a lot of credit because he deserves it, certainly. Um, my name is Frank Red. We're talking about the Golden State Warriors' biggest win of the year, uh, 134 to 120 over the Los Angeles Lakers. The Warriors now are 44 and 35. They matched their win total from last year. They got three more games to go. Um, when we were prognosticating about how many wins the Warriors would have this year, um, I said 50. Um, at the end of the day, with all of the ups and downs, this team has a chance to win 46 to 47 games. It is not uh, unreasonable for the Warriors on Sunday to look at the matchups and either say we need to put it, it, put our you know, put our foot on the gas or we need to take it off based on who the matchups are. Um, I don't know. So it's going to be interesting. They're going to win 46 or 47 games, which is a pretty good season. In the <laughs> Vicky said, I said 60. Really, Vicky? How'd you get 60? That's a lot of wins. They've had a good year. Now, there's another conversation out there. Would you prefer the Warriors playing a play-in scenario game on the road where they have a guarding road record or at home? The the athlete in me, the coach in me, uh, someone who uses logic, I'm playing at home all day. I don't care what the statistics say. I want to play at home. You know? And... Um, that's not even a conversation with me. But people who, who 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 wrap their arms around analytics might say, no, they play better on the road because of this reason, that reason. Um, I don't care. I want to play at home. So uh, if it came down to that, I want to see the Warriors at Chase. I think they have a better chance because the playoffs are different. It's not the regular season. All the one and two point losses. Oh my God. Yeah. Just gut wrenching. Not only that, Draymond was gone. How many games has Draymond missed this year, Vicky? 22 games or something like that? I mean, I don't think 60 games, but I think that the Warriors would clearly be a top five seed had not uh, Draymond missed all those games. They'd probably be around, what, 50 wins now? 51, 52, 53. So um, that's interesting. The Warriors take on the Portland Trailblazers on Thursday. Um, you got to go into Portland and just hammer those guys. You got to go hammer time on those guys. You can't give them any inkling of confidence. You need to break their confidence from the start. Literally get up 20 in the first quarter. Like the Clippers did to Portland. I mean, like the Clippers did to Phoenix tonight. Now, Phoenix ultimately made the game, but Phoenix was down 35 to 4 at home. I never believed in Phoenix. I never did. I don't believe in Phoenix. Even if they won a, 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 an opening round series, if they got there. I don't believe in Phoenix. I don't like how their team is constructed. I also think they got some leadership issues, you know? And people get real up, uptight. They get nervous. Nah, if you're the best player on the team, you're one of the best players on the team, you're accountable. Where's the accountability with Phoenix? Vogel, blame the coach. Give me a break. You got KD, you got Booker. 
no excuse for it. But leadership sometimes means being uncomfortable and being okay with it. A lot of players talk about it all the time. You know, that's why the Warriors have really won consistently because in between those walls, I'm sure things get uncomfortable and it's okay. When you have real relationships, when you have celebrity, when you have celebrity re relationships, I get why you might not want things to get uncomfortable, but when you really love your brother or your sister, it's okay to be uncomfortable because you're looking out for the betterment of everybody else. If you haven't seen that Draymond Green and, and uh, Clay Thompson interview, check it out. Check it out. It's really cool. Honest. I love it. Vicky says, Joe wants him to play at home. Dre missed a lot of games. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's illogical for forward-thinking people to think that you would want your team to play on the road in the playoffs. No, you want to play at home. Kitchen handy, first time you stepped in the dungeon. You might have been listening before, but welcome, man. Or young lady, I'm not quite sure who you are or uh, how you project yourself, but thank you for stepping in the dungeon. I really appreciate you. All right, my name is Frank Red, by the way. My king's choking hard after the two injuries. Yeah, they are. And uh, that bothers me um, because I love Sacramento. I, I covered the Kings for 10 plus years. And even with Herder and Monk being out, there's enough veteran leadership on that team that they should still be closing teams out. They were up, what, 20 tonight? Come on. In a game that mattered, they should beat OKC. You know, and, and again, Kitchen Handy's name is Spencer. Okay, Spencer. Um, I go back to what I just said before. Who on the Kings is willing to make things uncomfortable? They don't have that person. They don't. And again, when you don't have that person, everything falls on the coach. And, you know, Mike Brown's a solid coach. He's a good coach. He's not Steve Kerr. You know, he's not uh, Eric Spolstra. But he's a good coach. But sometimes your players have to elevate your coach to that next level. The Kings got two all-stars. DeMontis Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox. You shouldn't be losing to OKC on the road when you're up 20 in a game that you need to solidify your playoff position. SG, what's up, brother? Hello, how can I help? Um, I am doing fantastic right now uh, because I love watching basketball. I love watching sports. And I tell you what, uh, tonight was the most important game of the year for the Warriors. I didn't know what to expect. Um, I was presently surprised how smart they played. I mean, the 26 threes, you would assume, is an, is an aberration. Um, so that's that. But defensively, they were coordinated. They were totally unselfish. And they got contributions from everybody. And they looked like a playoff team that could make some noise. They looked like a Steve Kerr coach playoff team. It was all business. I love that. How's life going? Life is going okay. You like my content. Um, one of the things I did last week, uh, I don't know how you guys feel, I got an acupuncture treatment last week. I had, I, I, I've been doing that for over 10 years on my back. Um, 
but I hadn't done it in a couple of years. And I got to tell you, it worked like a charm. It worked like a charm. I was so relieved walking out of that facility um, after that 90 minute uh, process. So uh, anybody out there thinking about acupuncture for whatever reason, I'm all for it. Vicky says, I thought this year Sacramento would have a better record than last year. It's like they have regressed. It's too bad because last year they had it. Yeah, they have regressed. And um, there's several reasons for that. And it's not like centered in one particular area. I'll give you some. Their best player did not get better. Um, De'Aaron Fox has had a good year. He's not had a great year. DeMontis Sabonis is a very good player. He's not a great player. And part of that is coaching. It's not all his fault. When I look at players and I evaluate players, I'm looking at little morsels of development from year to year. I don't see that from him. I see a guy who works extremely hard, who's really good, who puts numbers up. But when he plays against really good competition, they take certain things away from him. And that gym work that I'm looking for, like a right-hand hook, a right-hand jump hook. Have you ever seen him shoot a right-hand jump hook? I haven't. Have you seen him shoot like a little eight, four, five footer? I haven't. So, you know. The third thing is Keegan Murray, he hasn't significantly improved. He might have gotten a little better, but he has not gotten significantly better. And I think the momentum and everything was trending in that direction. I'm not giving up on the Kings. Um, I think next year they could, you know, have a better year. I would expect them to, but they made some mistakes. Even going out and getting the guy from Europe was a mistake. You know, he could even get it. I mean, literally, literally, two weeks in the season, we knew that he couldn't even get in Mike Brown's rotation. Now, he's been hurt. Uh, Budenkoff, I, I don't want to kill the guy. Uh, but they paid him what? He, he got a nice contract, 25 to 35 million to sit on the bench, not even get in the game. SG said, I made a bet with my dad that if the Warriors won, he would have to give me $100. And if the Warriors lost, then I would have to give him $100. But we all know you don't keep your bets, right? We, Vicky, Vicky's already put that out there. Um, so good for your dad. If you won the bet and he wants to pay you, good for him. Because if you had lost, you weren't going to pay him. We already know that. Still haven't paid me. I've lost two bets on this show and paid both of them. I lost to Vicky and I lost to Brian Iglesias. And, and, and both people will concur that I am a man of my word. This sounds a little entitled. My dad has to give me a hundred dollars. Why? What are you, a baby? We won the bet fair and square. I won the bet with you fair and square. What are you talking about? I'm halfway joking. Yeah. But yeah, man, um, things are looking good for the Warriors to take on Portland on Thursday. Uh, that Friday night game scares the daylights out of me. Um, and I would say if you're a Warrior fan, a Warrior supporter, you have to be concerned also. Um, I hope that Kerr doesn't get too smart and says we're going to sit step on Thursday night. Don't do that. Because Portland got a bunch of young guys. You know, they got a bunch of young guys that are putting it out there. Uh, Scoot Henderson is playing a whole lot better now. Um, 
and he's kind of ramping up for the summer league. And I think next year, uh, um, the Warriors need to go into Portland full throttle and just crush those guys. Yes, Frank paid me my bet. Man, it was word. There you go, SG. Now, we can uh, knock around the Warriors or talk some other NBA stuff if you want to. But I want to transition uh, a little bit and, and, and give props to A number one, um, the women's NC2A. It was exhilarating. Um, I had so much fun. And, the you know, some of the storylines were a little crazy. Um, SJ, you can talk about anything you want to talk about as long as you're making a point. I'm not going to turn this into the 49ers postgame show. I'm not going to do that. But if you have something that brings um, interest to the show, then to put it out there and I'll put it on air. All right? Um, but think about this, y'all. The women outdrawing the men. And this is not just because of Caitlin Clark. The games were more interesting. The skill level in the women's game was higher. The personalities were more interesting. The coaches were more interesting. It was, I don't think they could, you can't use an adjective to describe how great the women's NC2A tournament was. Even the teams that lost were outstanding. Oregon State squad, they're solid. Now, I just found out today that um, one of their top players is going to get in the portal. Um, so maybe they won't be quite as good. But Oregon State's going to be really good. USC is going to be really good because they're going to use the portal. UCLA is going to be really good. Wow. As she says, the Iowa loss to South Carolina in the NCAA Women's Championship was very heartbreaking. Oh, you? Because you are an Iowa fan? I like basketball. I, I, would have, I, I would have no problem with Iowa winning if they beat South Carolina. But I'm rolling with Don Staley all day. Know why? Because I've been a women's fan for decades. I had a nice little Twitter conversation back and forth with uh, one of my favorite players, um, Val Whiting, the former Stanford All-American. I didn't even know she was on Twitter. I had, I had no idea. So I don't follow things that well. But um, I love I love basketball. I don't care if it's women's or it's men. What I do love, though, is women getting the recognition that they deserve and women getting money and making lives for themselves. Thoughts on Caitlin Clark's performance against South Carolina under... I thought Caitlin was great. I thought she had a great game. I mean, some of those step-back threes against... Great defense by Raven Johnson. Um, she's the only five-star player on Iowa's team. She's the only five-star recruit on the team. I don't think there's any other players on Iowa who even has a chance of playing in the W NBA. Maybe Stokely, maybe. She's only a sophomore. South Carolina probably has five to seven players that will play professional basketball. So, what a great story. Caitlin Clark is the female version. Okay. Uh, for the women's game, we're going to find out. Um, I, got a, I got a thought about some of the hate because some of it is hate. Some of it is jealousy. Some of it is competitive spirit. Um, but this is this is what I think. After 20 plus years of his existence, 
the WNBA is finally poised to become a thing. And, and, and when I say a thing, I mean financially. This is, I believe, a viable business at this point. There's, a, there's been a lot of broke ankles, a lot of bend gay, a lot of surgeries of women who had to put everything on the line to make this league work. They put the time in. And to kind of sit back and watch newbies kind of uh, get the benefits of their hard labor, why wouldn't you be jealous? Why wouldn't you have some angst? It's natural. So this is what I think should happen. I personally feel that all new WNBA franchises should have ownership from from veteran NBA uh, from veteran WNBA players. Because these are investments now. I mean, it's it's the right thing to do. Is the right thing to do. Bring these women on board who sacrifice, who paved the way for these young ladies now to literally be millionaires, even before the season starts. Caitlin, Caitlin Clark already is worth what three, five million dollars. She's not the only one. I love it. I can't wait. Um, Sabrina, Sabrina. Inescu is my favorite WNBA player. As she says, Caitlin Clark would be great playing on the Indiana Fever. Will be great. In the NBA alongside stars such as Aaliyah Boston and many others. Yeah, that should be fine. Should be fine. And I, I, I think the other thing that they're going to do to help her is they're going to limit the number of shots she takes. She's going to be a traditional point guard. I believe she is. She has those skills. There's no reason for her um, not to be um, a true point guard. I know you made a mistake, SG. It's all good. It's good. Um, and Indiana is a small enough market to give her a chance to ramp up. What, I, what I'm excited about, and I don't know the odds of it happening, but can you imagine the Warriors WNBA team having Paige Beckers on the team? I would love that. Because Paige is my favorite college player. Her mid-range game is crazy. So, a lot of good things on the horizon for the WNBA, and particularly here in, in Northern California. Um, I mentioned at the top of the show that Tyra Vanderveer is retiring. And she retired with three national championships, 1,216 victories. Um, it was, it was time for her to go. Not only because she's had this illustrious career, but I think her coaching style, um, was not conducive, isn't conducive to what's happening now with the portal and the individualism uh, that many of these young players bring into college. Tyra Vanderveer historically has wanted a basic point guard to pass the ball to the wings, feed the ball to the post, but she does not want any dynamic point guard. She's never had a dynamic point guard, never. Even though I love Molly Gutenbauer, one of my favorites, I wouldn't call her dynamic. Now she did have one. Who was the um, who was the girl who was a who who was a twin who played in the WNBA for a while? Played for a long time. Black girl. I can't think of her name. I apologize. Oh, um, was it? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Mark. But I but 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 I'll stand by what I said. Jennifer Az played for Stanford thirty years ago, and I almost believe that she was kind of great in spite of Tyra. She was so damn good that 
She couldn't hold her back. But who was the um I can't think of a name right now, but yeah, but but they had another great point guard who played about seven, eight years in WNBA as a guard. As she said, I'm going to attend at least seven to ten of the Warriors WNBA team. Good for you. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna spend some money. Uh I lightweight thought that Jennifer Az had a chance to um, uh, be named the coach of uh, the the WNBA Warriors team, but I guess I think she works for the Vegas. I think she works for the Raiders. No, the Aces. I think she works for the Aces. But I watched Jennifer Az at USF. She did a great job. She took USF to multiple NC2A champion. To multiple into she took USF University of San Francisco to multiple NC two A tournaments. Hell of a coach. And I thought it was lined up for her to be the coach at Stanford, but I guess she's moved on, and that's not going to be a part of her future. Uh, I guess Kate Pay uh, seemingly is going to be the head coach, so good for her. Um. I can't think of the young ladies now, but Stanford's backup point guard is really talented. She barely got a chance to play. She was really good and was glued to the bench all year. I didn't like that. But I'm a big Tyra Vanderbilt fan. I hope that um, she stays active in the game. Maybe she'll become a broadcaster. Maybe she'll move on to the pro ranks. You know, that's not a crazy idea is that crazy would tara at this point in her life want to keep coaching and move on to the WNBA? talk about serendipity right now now kelsey plum played at the university of washington and she's still actively playing she didn't go to stanford she went to washington she played for the Aces. Hell of a player. And got a lot of swag as well. Um, I'm going to go left um, and talk about something really quickly. You guys know that I love music. I'm an artist myself. Um, I just finished writing a song that I'm going to record next week that I love, very emotional song for me. It's about one of my coaches. So this will be the first time that I've kind of delved into recording songs about like sports. But be on the lookout for that. Um, but there's been a lot of hoopla around Beyonce making a country album, right? Stay with me, everybody, stay with me. And I didn't get caught up in it because I know a lot of it is just hate, right? Uh, a lot of it is not wanting to share that community uh, with other people. While Taylor, Taylor Swift bounces from country to pop anytime she wants to, but Beyonce for some reason can't do it. All right. It wasn't like I was going to go out and buy Beyonce's country album. But when I hear something that I like, I acknowledge it. Now, you guys also know that I am the biggest fan of Miley Cyrus. Miley Cyrus to me, take sales out of it. Miley Cyrus is the artist of her generation. There's nobody in her age group touching her. Nobody. Her voice is iconic. Nobody emotes, nobody exhibits the level of emotion in every song that Miley Cyrus just naturally does. Guess what? Miley Cyrus and Beyonce did a song together on Beyonce's album called Second Most Wanted. Incredible song. I love this song. Love it. So check that out. I, I can't see anybody 
not like it. Even the most staunch country fans have to like say, yo, man, that song is dope. Mark Grace says, Miley Cyrus played with Metallica. She got versatility. No, I I mean, from going from like little childhood roles to being the child of a iconic father, you know, family in this business, to do the things that she's done and she's doing is incredible. Now, obviously, I mean, we knew her more than anything for her marriage. Um, she's kind of through that. I'm, I'm so happy for her because, again, um, she's the best of the best to me. I would love to interview Jess Smith, the president of the WNBA Golden State team. Um, I've heard her interview. Uh, I'm sure that she's going to, I mean, you're going to hear her a lot more. I don't know if, if uh, this is the right place. Maybe, who knows? Hannah Montana to now. Right, exactly. SG, I love Hannah Montana. Yeah. I just didn't know she had the chops. I didn't know that she had the, the you know, the art, you know, the artistic credibility. I, I didn't know that she didn't. Uh but as an adult woman, I'm all over her. I love what she brings to music. Um, and, and she's so authentic. She's so authentic. She really is. Going back, were you thinking of, no, um, Shanae Abumake? No, no. Um, this young lady is, um, okay, I'll help you. She, she was a twin and she is the, the, the sibling of a former major league player. Uh, I think of the San Diego Padres. That should help you. Uh, shortstop, I believe. Who had some issues. And her brother wasn't the athlete that she is. You get the limo out front. Ooh, wee. Hottest styles. Every shoe. Every color. Yeah. When you're famous... It can be you. you get the, okay. I'm not quite sure what you're talking about there. The other thing I wanted to talk about is um, I saw an incredible movie on Friday. And the movie is grade A. The movie is Monkey Man. I don't know if you guys are into action movies, John Wick style. Um, but it was directed, co-written by... Dev Patel, Slumdog Millionaire, fame. And um, the reason why I want to acknowledge this is because Hollywood conveniently hides behind um, tried and true methods when it's really well, not all the time, but sometimes it's racism. And Hollywood says, listen, we can't make this movie because it's not bankable. Nobody wants to see that. You know, this is the first time that we've seen a American distributed action movie by someone of Indian descent. And guess what? Dev Patel pulled it off. Monkey Man is awesome. I mean, literally, if you like the first John Wick movie, it's right there. So if you like those types of movies, I would say go out and support that genre. No, it's not Diamond to Shields. Diamond to Shields did not go to Stanford. Diamond to Shields went to Duke and Tennessee. She's a really good player, by the way. Uh, 
I don't have the time to look it up now, but 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 I will. But if you like action movies, Monkey Man by Dev Patel is really really good. It highlights various aspects of uh, Indian culture. Mark, you need your own show, dude. Yeah, Candace Wiggins is her name. Yes. There you go. How much did you have to dig for that, Mark? Mark always bails me out. I love it. Okay. Mark says I looked it up. Yeah. I got a good memory. I got a good memory. There's a, there's a lot of facts and stuff in this dome. Yeah, Candace Wiggins was a hell of a player. And um, probably the second best point guard that uh, Tyra Vanderveer had. Uh, Jennifer Azey, the Olympian, is number one to me. Then Candace. And my favorite, just because of how she played the game, is Molly Gutenbauer. I love Molly Gutenbauer. Love her. Tough. Scrape her knees. She played with Val Whiting. She'd do whatever she needed to do to get the job done. She was awesome. Mark says, you got too much in your dome. <laughs> That's probably true. That's probably true. That's why I got to get it out. Right? I got to come on in the dungeon show and get it out. So, um... I could talk also a lot about men's college basketball. Um, UConn was impressive, but not for, for the reasons that a lot of people think. I don't think that they're among, I mean, when I look at among the best teams of all time, I don't think that they're there. I think they're, for this era, they're really good. To win back to back anything is an extraordinary accomplishment. But what I take from UConn is the excellent coaching of Danny Hurry, of Dan Hurley. He's a brilliant coach, and he has the ability to hold his players accountable um, very freely without a, a, a tug and a pull. Guy's a brilliant coach, but here's the deal. I grew up in New York. I'm not surprised. His father, Bob Hurley, is one of, I believe, four coaches in the hall, four high school coaches in the Hall of Fame. So he was destined to do what he's doing. And he's brilliant. Give him all the credit in the world. But I don't think they have a lottery pick for that team. I don't think they do. I, I think they got some good players. Some of them will have decent NBA careers. But I don't see a, a Rip Hamilton on that team. I don't. I don't. Uh, Klingon... I think he should stay another year in college. I honestly do. I think if he stayed one more year and he really put that work in, uh, he could be really, really dominant next year. But if he comes into the NBA, he's going to be like a 10, 12-minute, 15-minute guy who is essentially a defensive player. Uh, Edie, I'm rooting for Edie. It's going to take him some time. I think he will have an NBA career, but... Um, it's going to take him some time. Mickey said, did you see King Arthur, the dog movie? Wow. This is one of the best movies. I didn't see it, but that's on my list, Vicky. I'm going to check it out. As she says, Monkey Man was inspired by the legend. Yeah, I know. Hanuman, a Hindu deity revered for his strength, loyalty, and courage. Yeah, I know. Now go watch the movie. All right. All right, everybody. I'm going to stay true to what uh, I had planned to do, which is be on for one hour. We are coming up on 60 minutes. I'm going to step off. And uh, maybe... Uh, I'll do another show on Thursday. I want to thank everybody for stepping in the dungeon tonight. 
Uh, if you don't follow me on Twitter, hit me up at Big Frank Red. Subscribe to the show. Hit the like button. It certainly helps all of the loyal followers and contributors out there. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. I'm going to do my thing and get out of here. Success and getting paid is a manifestation of the whole process. If you as an individual don't do things to help other people make their lives better, as far as I'm concerned, you haven't done nothing. All right? Have a great week. Good win by the Warriors. And I'll talk to you guys later. Peace.